from confiscating illegal items in New York's largest airport, to breaking down retired cruise ships in Turkey, to importing millions of flowers. Getting people and things where they need to be requires hard work. Rain, snow, hail, storm, there's no stopping us. This season, we go inside the big business of ships, trucks, and planes, and how they move goods, get rid of trash, and deliver life-saving vaccines. Our first story takes us to John F. Kennedy Airport in Queens, New York. Here, customs officers are tasked with stopping any drugs and prohibited food from entering the country. About 43,000 international travelers fly into New York's John F. Kennedy Airport every day. By passenger volume, it's the U.S.'s largest international airport of entry. And in just Terminal 4 alone, that equates to almost 1,000 bags an hour. And in those suitcases, there's a lot of stuff, some of which isn't allowed into the country, including 120 pounds of food per day. So what happens to all those confiscated items anyway? If you flew into JFK in the 90s, getting something into the U.S. was a lot easier. But after 9-11, a conversation started about how to protect the country from dangerous foods, drugs, and people. And U.S. Customs and Border Protection, as it's known today, was formed. You'll generally see two kinds of CBP officials at airports. Officers like Steve and agriculture specialists like Ginger. Their job is to find, seize, and destroy millions of items each year that don't belong in the United States. It's a big job, and sometimes it requires a sidekick. A sidekick on four legs. This is K9 Spike. Look, Spike. He is a eight-year-old Belgian Malawa. I've been his only handler from day one. He's trained in narcotics. During the duration of our career, probably sees over 400 different seizures. CBP officials like Steve identify high-risk individuals trying to enter into the U.S., as well as drugs and firearms. And because these are such high stakes, dogs like Spike are trained in a special way, in what's called passive response. Meaning if they sniff out drugs, they don't scratch, they don't bark, and they don't make a scene. They sit. And if they're right, the dog gets rewarded. His reward is actually this toy right here. So he likes to play. So, ain't that right? You like to play, you like to play. Yes you do, yes you do. Let me see it, let me see it. Here at the port, we've caught up to 16 keys of ecstasy recently. Narcotics are then seized and sent to be incinerated. The incinerator's location is kept a secret, as a matter of national security. Now, pretty much everyone knows that narcotics aren't allowed through U.S. borders. But actually, drugs aren't the most commonly seized item at JFK. Food is. When a regular traveler arrives in the U.S., they're required to declare any food items they're bringing in, or face up to a $1,000 fine for the first offense. These items aren't taken because agents want to eat your yummy Spanish ham or Caribbean mangoes. It's because agents are responsible for protecting American agriculture from any foreign pests or diseases that could affect our livestock or crops. And that's where agricultural specialists like Ginger come in. Everything gets destroyed. To protect against that pest risk, we are protecting the country's agricultural interests. We're protecting against bioterrorism, where someone could intentionally try to bring in items to wreak havoc in this country. Foreign bugs hitchhiking in luggage have wreaked havoc in the U.S. before. Florida's orange and grapefruit growers lost $2.9 billion from 2007 to 2014, thanks to the Asian citrus psyllid. And since being introduced into the U.S. in the 90s, the Asian longhorn beetle has ravaged hardwood trees. Eradication efforts between 1997 and 2010 cost more than $373 million. In our country, we go into the grocery store and the food is always there. We don't have to look at it for holes or check if it's got some disease on it. It always looks great. So we get kind of spoiled and we don't really understand the importance of, of protecting that. So it's crucial that even a single stowaway orange is found and confiscated. But with 34 million annual international passengers to and from JFK, going through each of those bags can seem pretty impossible. For humans, that is. Luckily, they've got a little help from the Beagle Brigade, 
This four-legged officer is Biscuit, and like Spike, Biscuit is trained in passive response. But Biscuit's trained to sniff out food, rather than drugs. They actually learn. They start out with five target odors, and then over the years, he'll expand, and they retire with sometimes like 150 odors that they know. And Biscuit's pretty good at sniffing. These beagles have an estimated 90% accuracy rate. Watching your dog sit on three grapes in a Samsonite hard side suitcase is just incredible. Scientists say their nose is a thousand times stronger than ours, and they prove it every single day. Once Biscuit sniffs out an item, the passenger in question and their bags go to Ginger, who will x-ray and search the luggage. Okay, these are both your bags, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you pack everything yourselves? Okay. You pack your bags yourself? Okay. Ginger unzips the bag and searches each one by hand. And if she finds something that's not allowed, it's seized and held in temporary bins. This is very common from that region. Once you open it all up, you have grape leaves. These are horse meat sausages. This is another very good example of what we get very frequently, especially in the springtime. This is a plant that they're planning on bringing here to grow. So anything for propagation has additional entry requirements. So this is two families worth <laughs> from one flight. JFK disposes of the contraband food in one of two ways, the grinder or the incinerator. Ginger will bag up the seized items and label them based on their final destination. So we're gonna go walk this bin, nice and full from those two passengers, down to our contraband room. This is the room where illicit food meets its end. This is our grinding machine. This is what we'll generally use for fruits, vegetables, that kind of commodities. It is called the Muffin Monster. But before Ginger can send a piece of fruit down the Muffin Monster, she cuts it open, squishes it, and inspects it. She's looking for evidence of diseases, insertion points for insects, and exit points for larvae. If she finds a little bug, like this one, she neutralizes the pest risk and sends it to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for further investigation. Now it's back to the muffin monster. 120 pounds of food are grinded up each day from arriving international passengers. Avocados, mangoes, and citrus are among the most common fruits that end up in the grinder. We do get messy. It's important to dispose of it properly. I love to eat as much as everybody else. I am a big fan of food, but I know the importance of making sure that what we seized because of established risks is disposed of properly to prevent it from causing problems. So the next time you've got an orange tucked into your luggage, declare it and let experts like Ginger decide if it's immiscible and leave the Serrano ham in Spain because Biscuit will find it. Next up, we're taking off to a desert in Tucson, Arizona to see how retired military aircraft are repaired and restored. The 309th AMAR stores the world's largest collection of military aircraft here in the Arizona desert. I like to call this the ugliest plane out here, the YC-14. It was an aircraft that never went into production. 800 mechanics work nonstop, reclaiming critical parts and regenerating aircraft so they can go back into service. I can't just pull over an airplane like you can a car, and we have to make sure that these aircraft are safe to fly. Our goal is not to be like a cemetery for the aircraft. That's Colonel Barnard. She's served 25 years as a U.S. Air Force aircraft maintenance officer. As a commander here, I am in charge of the whole operation. The assets stored here are worth somewhere between 34 and $35 billion if you were to try to replace them all. <laughs> it's a big number. <laughs> she took us inside this massive facility to see how these military planes get a second chance at life. AMAR got its start back in 1946. After World War II, the Army needed a place to store old planes. They chose Davis Monthan Air Force Base, here in Tucson. With nearly 2,000 football fields worth of open desert, there was plenty of space. We're known worldwide as the Boneyard. Our guys take pride in being Boneyard Wranglers. Arizona has the perfect weather for storing these assets. It's hot, there's little rainfall, no humidity, and the soil? That's as hard as concrete. So planes won't sink. 
the dryness as well as the lack of acidity in the soil prevent corrosion on the assets. Aircraft come here from the Department of Defense, military, other government agencies, and foreign allies. We have about 3,100 airplanes. The planes are mostly military. They come from the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and the Marines. We have over 80 different types of airplanes here. Planes and helicopters arrive and are lined up in sections. So we're driving down display row here, or celebrity row as some people call it. We do have a sense of humor here. That's our stealth aircraft, which is actually just Wonder Woman's jet. The LC-130s have skis along with their landing gear so they can land down in Antarctica and support the National Science Foundation all across that continent. We're coming up on a NASA aircraft. It's affectionately called the Vomit Comet. Some aircraft will be here for weeks before they're called back into service. Other aircraft can be here for 50 years, similar to this A4 Skyhawk. Each plane goes through a preservation process before it's put in the desert. Those that may fly again are re-preserved every four years. They're defueled, then oil is pumped through the engine to preserve it. The black material that we have on here is the base layer that seals up the aircraft. And then later, as you can see the rest of the aircraft around here, the coats on top are white, and those white coats will reflect the heat, so it better preserves the assets all on the inside of the aircraft. Like the inside of the C-5A Galaxy. Inside of the C-5, it's the largest cargo aircraft in the Air Force inventory. I have deployed on these. One of six deployments Colonel Barnard's had to Afghanistan, New Zealand, and Antarctica. And we can fit three HH-60 helicopters and a lot of our equipment that we need, as well as all our maintainers. We have just over 60 of them here. And every one of them needs 72 tie-downs. Airplanes are designed to fly, and when it gets a little breezy out here, we want to make sure they stay parked. But not every plane just sits around collecting dust. U.S. military units around the world can request specific parts off these planes. An aircraft has so many thousands of parts. Just like a reservoir keeps things in case you need them, and then we release what's out of the reservoir as needed. And some of the parts the military can only find here at AMARG. We are that assurance that there's a part available when the supply system main sources don't get it. We send anywhere from 4,000 to 7,000 parts out every year to the tune of a few million dollars each week worth of supply parts. Scott and James here are removing the engines from the back of this T-38 as a reclamation effort because these have been requested to go back into service. So once the crews reclaim the parts out in the desert and bring them into the end of this building, they get washed, they get non-destructive inspection, and they're going to pack and ship these right out the door as fast as we can. But sometimes, instead of being used for parts, an entire plane will be regenerated, meaning they'll pull it out of the desert and wash it down. We have to remove all the coatings that are used to preserve the aircraft out in the desert. After getting a nice shower, it's fixed up. What our team is working on here is a C-130 that's be regenerated for foreign military sales. In this hangar, the current project that we're working on is F-16s and post-black repair. It's a package of structural improvements on the aircraft to extend their flyable life. The unit also handles aircraft modifications. These aircraft come from U.S. units that are active right now, and then they get some work done on them, and they go back out to that same unit. We're able to upgrade those and modify them to keep them up with the current standards in the active fleet. Complicated individual pieces are sent to separate back shops for repair and overhaul. Here in the wing shop, we have all the center portions of the A-10 wings being rebuilt here and the outer portions being rebuilt there. There's actually hundreds of pieces inside of an aircraft wing. The complexity and the level of structure, it's really eye-opening for many folks. Each set of wings can take up to 20,000 man hours to overhaul. Once parts are fixed, they go through a thorough inspection. We're here in the non-destructive inspection area. Pete's working on a fluorescent dye penetrant. It's basically a, a liquid that absorbs into cracks and we can apply a black light to it. And you can see there is a crack right here that shows up. This crack right here on this part in the landing gear could cause catastrophic failure on the landing gear. Not a single crack on an entire plane can get past this team. We have to make sure that these aircraft are safe to fly so that we protect that asset and we protect the air crew that's inside of that asset. So the stakes are pretty high. Once fixed, the planes go through a rigorous final flight test. Pilot Scott Thompson is testing these regenerated F-16s. I will take them out to the airspace just south of here, close enough to where if I do have a problem, I can get back onto the ground immediately and pretty much put them through the ringer. We test flight controls and the handling and the injured performance and all the systems on the plane pretty extensively at all altitudes. They go out to become full-scale aerial targets. That's a happy ending for a plane pulled from the desert here at AMARG. But for other aircraft, this is the end of the line. 
The planes marked with a big D go through pre-demilitarization and then are destroyed by a third-party contractor. So these are guys that work the demil and they prepare aircraft for disposal. Well, and I will get out of the way of the crowbar. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty good at destruction too, but you guys are being super careful about it, which yeah, you should be. Yeah. The planes are demolished for good reason. To make sure everything's accounted for and that the materials and the technology don't fall into the wrong hands. While some Americans may not have heard of AMARG, it actually saves taxpayers a lot of money. The assets stored here are worth somewhere between 34 and $35 billion. And so to make a new one may not be possible versus to rejuvenate an old one might be the best case scenario. But for the workers, it's not just about saving the military some money. It's also about giving these planes another life. A lot of these airplanes haven't flown for a very long time. I flew a lot of them operationally back in the day. It's great to get back in them and, and bring them back to life. These airplanes have a lot of stories to tell, and it's wonderful to spend time with them and think about that. There are very few of us military that are lucky enough to be assigned here. It's just a joy to be able to work with these people every day and be around these airplanes. Landing in the Caribbean, we go inside the world's largest cruise ship to see how its crew deals with millions of pounds of waste a year. This cruise ship is basically a floating city. And just like in a normal city, all its residents produce a lot of trash. But there aren't any garbage trucks here to scoop it up and take it away. We're at sea, obviously. And since waste can't and shouldn't just be dumped in the ocean, well, what do cruise ships do with all of it? This is something the industry has been dealing with for years. Carnival Cruise Line is coming clean about polluting oceans. Princess Cruises was fined $40 million in 2016 for illegal dumping. And Carnival got hit with a $20 million fine in 2019 for disposing of plastic waste in the ocean. Carnival Corporation's issues really brought the need for better technology so that these ships can operate more efficiently. Cruise lines have been working on systems to purify water and deal with waste inside ships. Up until now, these types of options weren't available. All this new tech was built into Royal Caribbean's largest and newest ship, Symphony of the Seas. The company says it's a zero landfill ship, which means it uses everything from recycling to water filtration to deal with its own waste. And this guy is in charge of making sure no single water bottle is unaccounted for. Welcome to Waste and Recycling Center. We're down on deck two, a secret crew only area of the ship. Crew members check all the ship's trash cans for recyclables and bring them down here for Alex's team to handle. Despite being the only waste facility on this massive ship, it's surprisingly quiet. Alex said the busiest time is in the morning when things are unpackaged for the day. This is the waste streams that we have. Every waste stream has its own way of handling it. There are separate teams to deal with each incoming recyclable glass, cardboard, plastic, and metal. This is our incinerator room. So we have two incinerators, one and two. This area is manned 24 hours a day. We have 10 crew members who are working here, five in the morning and five in the evening. Crew members separate glass into colors, green, brown, and white. See, this is the byproduct of it after we crush it. They can process upwards of 13,000 pounds of glass for a week-long cruise. All the small glass pieces are stored in bins until the ship docks. Plastic goes through this massive compactor. Even though the ship's gotten rid of plastic straws, it still relies on bottled water. Because for health and safety reasons, no cruise ship is allowed to have water fountains. So every week, they crush about 528 gallons of water bottles. We are compacting the cardboard over there. Throughout the day, cardboard is stacked up in this machine, called a baler. Once it's full, it's all compressed into bundles. And used aluminum cans, well, they're sent through this baler. The machine squeezes them down into big cubes, which are then stored in a fridge just off the waste room. This area is actually for the items that can produce smell, the garbage. And that smell could get pretty bad. The waste is stored for up to seven days at a time, until the ship docks back in Miami, where all the plastic, aluminum, paper, and glass go to recycling partner facilities. In 2018, Royal Caribbean recycled 43.7 million pounds of waste. And any rebates earned from these recycling programs go back to the Employee Retirement Fund. The cruise line is hoping that it's a nice incentive for employees to bring recycling down from their own crew cabins. So what about things that can't get recycled? For example, food. Every week, the ship loads up 600,000 pounds of provisions. 
But for the food that's not eaten, well, the company had to figure out how to get rid of all of that, too. Each one of the ship's restaurants and 36 kitchens has its own suction drain. Chefs and waiters keep food scraps in separate buckets. Then, once they've gotten enough, they place it all in this special drain. All the food waste ends up in one big pipe that runs through the entire ship. And that pipe leads to what's known as the hydroprocessor. Those pipes over there, so these were the food waste is passing through. This is being uh, processed through here. This machine has a bunch of tiny layers of mesh to break down the food. It's being stored in our tank. We have two tanks of comminuted food waste. And the final step, incineration. Now let's talk about your toilet waste. Yep, we're gonna go there. It's all part of the water treatment system on board, controlled from the engineering room. All the wastewater that we are generating on board the ship is being collected. Nothing goes overboard unless we have run it through a treatment plant. Water is divided into two categories. Gray water from sinks, laundries, and drains, and black water. That includes everything from the galleys and your toilets, including your urine. This is then being mixed together and run through the advanced wastewater purification plant. The purification system purifies the water to a point above the U.S. federal standard, which is almost safe to drink. And then it runs several filtration processes before it's being kept on board or it's being discharged overboard when we are at sea with a certain distance from land in order to meet the different local and uh, international regulations. Anything that can't be recycled or reused on board goes to what's known as a waste to energy facility. Now we didn't get to see it for ourselves, but Royal Caribbean said heat or gas from the waste is collected and converted to energy. That's definitely within their best interest to be the most environmentally friendly because it significantly can reduce the waste on board, the weight that they have to carry, the fuel usage, and it reduces our operational expenses as well. And after one week at sea, the recycling gets cleared out, incoming provisions are brought on board, and the crew prepares the ship to start the process all over again. But these cruise ships don't last forever. At the end of their lives, they're sent here to Western Turkey to be demolished. For these $300 million cruise ships, this is the end of the line. Because of the pandemic, Carnival, Costa, and Pullmanter cruise lines have all sent ships to Western Turkey for demolition. Here, they'll be ripped to shreds deck by deck and sold for parts. But dismantling a ship that holds 2,000 passengers, well, that's... One of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Shipbreakers saw off massive sections of the hull and moved them overhead. There's millions of dollars worth of parts at stake, but any misstep could mean injury or hurting the environment. And it's only gotten harder with lots of new arrivals. We take you inside the yard, turning these floating hotels into this. Before the pandemic, the Aliaga shipbreaking yards were pretty quiet. Normally, the 22 yards only demolished a few dozen cargo ships a year. But when the pandemic wrecked the cruising industry, more and more cruise ships ended up here. After losing more than $4 billion in the second quarter of 2020, Carnival Cruise Line decided it was more affordable to sell its old ships for parts than try to keep them operating. Aliaga will be the last stop for Carnival's inspiration, imagination, and fantasy ships. Şu arkamda görmüş olduğunuz e, cruise gemileri özellikle belki bir 5 yıl, 10 yıl daha kadar çalışabilirdi. Yaklaşık 5 yıl, 10 yıl daha çalışacak, çalışabilecek durumda olan gemilerini Aliaga'ya gönderdiler. Captains navigate the cruise liners from the US, UK, and Italy. They coordinate with the harbor master to beach ships. Then the bow front of the vessel is grounded on the shore while the stern is still afloat. We plan how we cut the vessels together with our technical department. Then 2,500 shipbreakers set out to remove any valuable material. There are very expensive navigational equipments at bridge side. Working one deck at a time, crews take out all the furniture, mostly by hand. We're talking everything from chairs, tables, and pianos to light fixtures and beds. I can easily say that uh, cruise vessels are the hardest vessel type to dismantle because, you know, there are hundreds of rooms on board. Then they move on to amenities, dismantling gyms, pools, and theaters. Stripping walls, windows, floors, and handrails is next. 
This is where lots of saws and blowtorches come in. Workers risk daily falling from great heights, inhaling toxic gases during cutting operations, being hit by falling objects, and the blowtorch comes with fire hazards. They are working in very high degrees under the sun in summer times or they are working in, in very extreme conditions in winter time. Bu iş e, İlo'yu biliyorsunuz. E, İlo'nun e, listesine göre dünyanın en zorlu işi. Since October 2020, two workers have died from falling objects. The vessel lies on water, so there is no any way for the ambulance to reach in case of emergency situations. Despite these injuries, working conditions in Aliaga are better than those of the world's biggest shipbreaking yards. In South Asia, in Bangladesh, India and Pakistan, where most of the end-of-life vessels end up every year, dozens of people die or get injured in the process. Those yards in South Asia use the dangerous gravity method. That is dropping huge blocks into the water onto the beach. But in Turkey, workers lift ship parts with a massive crane. Which has a 2,000 ton capacity in our shore side. And we cut big blocks at the vessel. And by using this huge crane, we take these big blocks at our secondary cutting zone. Aliaga hasn't always had the safest yards. In the late 90s, Turkey was just as bad as South Asia. But in 2002, Greenpeace released a report that revealed the unsafe work conditions here and the world took notice. As a reaction to this international criticism, things have, have improved considerably. Things got even safer in 2018, when some Aliaga yards started complying with the European Union shipbreaking regulation. That's why Carnival chose two yards here for its end-of-life ships. Sekiz tane firma Avrupa Birliği kriterleriyle ilgili e, sertifika lisansları var bunların. Those EU guidelines have also raised the standards for environmental practices. Every cruise ship has dozens of toxins hidden inside. Things like asbestos in pipes, heavy metals in paints, biological hazards from sewage tanks, radioactive material from gauges, and the list goes on. Left unchecked, they can seep into the soil, beach, and water, where they've destroyed local marine habitats and water systems around shipbreaking yards before. But because of these new regulations, Aliaga got newer and better drainage systems and cement floors in the secondary cutting area, so workers weren't cutting ship parts on open beach. They also got new oil booms for containing oil spills, a new waste management center for properly disposing of those toxins in the ship, and a better asbestos removal process. Practices have been improved, but there are still concerns related to the long-term impact on the health of the workers due to exposure to toxic substances. Nicola says many workers aren't aware of these risks. And the rest choose the job anyway because of the high pay. Şu anda gemi söküm çalışan normal işçi abilerimizin almış olduğu ücretler yaklaşık 1500 dolar seviyesinde ve bu da ciddi bir rakama tekabül ediyor Türkiye şartlarında. Eğitim yönünden çok fazla kendini gelişme fırsatı bulamamış abilerin alabileceği gerçekten ciddi bir rakam. After the ship is demolished, this is all that's left. While the whole process takes six months for a cargo ship, it takes a lot longer for a cruise ship. Almost one year, maybe more. Workers move everything pulled off the ships into separate piles. Electronics, light fixtures, textiles, furniture, glass, and machinery. Tabii, diğer yolcu gemilerden çıkan ahşaptır, koltuktur, e, mutfak malzemeleridir. Bunlar da tekrar geri dönüştürülüyor. Kafeler, restoranlar, oteller. Buyers interested in cruise memorabilia claim the life jackets, art, and maps from antique sellers. But what about all that metal? Şimdi tabii bu gemiler burada sökülüyor. Sökülürken de bu malzemeler e, yeni foçada bunların tamamı burada kesilen demir e, metal kısmı tekrar geri dönüştürülüp e, inşaat demiri vesaire demiri malzeme haline geliyor. In 2020, Omel estimates workers pulled over a million tons of steel off cruise ships here and that'll all be recycled. Recycling steel, instead of mining the raw materials, reduces definitely energy requirements and, and the carbon footprint. Bu demiri madenlerden çıkartmak için, mesela şu arkamda gördüğünüz gemi yaklaşık 30 bin ton. 30 bin ton demiri madenden çıkartmak için ne kadar büyük bir insan gücü, ne kadar büyük bir ticari yatırım gerektirdiğini düşünürsek, bunun çöpe gitmesi ya da hani yok olup heba olup gitmesi dense, biz burada onları alıp tekrar ekonomiye kazandırıyoruz. It's estimated scrap metal from one ship could pull in around 4 million 
million dollars in profit for the shipbreaking association. You can make good money because there are lots of things on board for second and sales. Demolishing these bigger ships has led to larger profits and a growing workforce for Aliaga shipyards. Sadece de pandemiden sonra e, kruz gemilerinin buraya gelip e, bizim kapasitemize yüzde otuz bir artı sağladı. But as shipbreaking booms, it comes on the heels of a crumbling cruise industry. While Turkey destroys cruise ships, New York City produces boatloads of trash every single day. This is just three days worth of trash, most coming from New York City. And that claw is taking it to be burned into electricity. But we're not actually in New York City. We're in Jersey. Once the garbage man comes and picks it up, you don't think any more about it. But it has a long way to go after that. None of New Yorkers' waste is processed in the city. Instead, it ends up as far away as Ohio, Pennsylvania, and even South Carolina. So getting trash from here to here takes thousands of workers, trucks, trains, cranes, and even barges, operating nonstop to ship waste across the East Coast. Rain, snow, hail, storm, there's no stopping us. And it all costs the city hundreds of millions. Here's what actually happens to New York City's 3.2 million tons of trash a year. New York City's Department of Sanitation sends its fleet of 2,000 garbage trucks to start picking up at 5 a.m. You have to keep active. Some guys like to work out, some guys don't. Basically, it depends on you. What do you do? Me? I don't work out. This is my workout. This is my daily workout. That's Frank, a 23-year veteran sanitation worker. Well, you get immune to the smell. You don't smell garbage, you smell money. Second to see how solid it is. You can tell when the truck is full. Frank heads to the dump station in the Upper East Side. By then, the sun's coming up. We are currently at 91st Street MTS. Doors will open as the truck comes in, and there's radiation detectors that will read the truck. Trucks pause at the way station to help the city keep track of how much trash New Yorkers produce. Then handles tilt the hopper. Then she'll push the blade, and the blade will push the, the material all the way out to clear the whole truck. It's roughly 450 to 600 tons a day. Tractors move the trash into the containers beneath the ground. It's sort of a dance. One FBL will clear the wall and one FBL will blow containers. Getting the material containerized as quickly as possible and sealed keeps that smell down. A stamper then packs in the garbage. Mattresses are used like a sponge to sop up anything left over. When we have garbage on the floor, it'll take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to load a container. Once the Department of Sanitation seals a container and slides it out to the dock, responsibility then goes to Covanta. The waste energy company handles two marine transfer stations in the city. Containers are picked up by the crane and put on the barge. 48 containers go on the barge. Every one of these containers represents a truckload that we have taken off of the city streets and out of the tunnels, reducing carbon emissions and reducing congestion and wear and tear on the city's infrastructure. A tug attaches to the loaded trash barge. Tug Captain Jason Harris is now in charge. He gets the go-ahead for a 9.30 a.m. departure. What you see here is, is called Hell's Gate. This is the upper end of the East River. Tides play a major factor in the times that we can transfer barges. You can't go against the tide when it's max tide. It's too strong. We would actually come to a dead stop on this boat and barge. You wait until you can go with it. Quite often, a barge gets, gets filled up, and we will have to wait two, three, maybe four hours before the tide is, is in the favor. He navigates this heavy load safely along one of the busiest waterways in the world, down the East River, through New York Harbor to Staten Island. Three hours later, the tug and barge back up into the global transfer station. It is an inherently dangerous operation to move heavy equipment overhead. Then a train takes it to one of Covanta's waste to energy facilities. It can also get there via truck. All of Manhattan's residential trash goes to waste energy facilities like this one to be burned and turned into electricity. This facility processes up to a million tons of waste annually. Once the trucks scale in and come up to the tipping floor, they dump in front of one of these bays. Tractors push the trash into a massive storage pit, 93 feet deep and 270 feet long. Between eight and 9,000 tons are in the refuse pit. It's about three to four days worth of trash. A giant grapple claw descends over the trash. In one swoop, it can pick up as much as one trash truck carries. 
the claw builds a wall of trash to prevent it from avalanching onto the tipping floor. It also helps to make more space for incoming refuse. You look at garbage a very different way since I've been working here. We create a lot of garbage as, as a population. Two claws work together in tandem, dumping trash into hoppers leading to the incinerator. Romeo's an expert giant claw operator. 21 years of playing the game. There is no shortage of fuel for our boilers. Toy Story is the first thing everyone thinks of. Disney actually got inspiration for the Toy Story 3 incinerator sequence from a Covanta plant. The incinerators burn the trash at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes one to two hours to burn an entire hopper load. We've now entered the control room area of the plant. This is the brain of the operation. Yes, it is. <laughs> and here's your brain. He's got camera views of the combustion zone. How important are you for this, this place running correctly? How important am I? I am the guy. <laughs> I, I am the guy. He's in the hot seat. Russell monitors as the furnace heats up steam turning this turbine and generating enough energy to power this plant and 46,000 homes in the region. After everything's burned, all that's left over is ash and metal. This magnet pulls off enough metal to make 21,000 cars. The leftover ash goes to cover landfills. Next, the plant tackles those nasty fumes that burning trash causes. First, leftover gases go through a scrubber reactor. A lime slurry cleans any acid gases, and activated carbon absorbs pollutants. Then it goes through a bag house, basically a bunch of filters. So what's left coming out of that smokestack? Constituents of the flue gas is what's in normal air, like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, moisture. The alternative to this would be going to a landfill. Waste to energy does produce CO2 emissions. But in a year, this process eliminates a million tons of CO2 emissions a landfill would have produced. We generate a very small amount of methane. The methane we offset from a landfill results in an actual decrease of CO2 emissions. The city hopes to keep moving trash on waterways to facilities like this one. It's all part of its goal of becoming zero waste to landfill by 2030, but that is becoming harder and harder to reach. Only about 30% of New York City's waste turns into energy. The rest ends up in harmful methane producing landfills as far away as South Carolina and Ohio. And it takes a significant investment to move it. Every year exporting trash costs the city about $400 million. So why does New York City send its trash so far away? In 1881, New York City streets were notoriously filthy. So dirty, people were getting sick. So the Department of Sanitation was established to clean up the streets. And the department did help mop up the city, but the city quickly ran out of room to put all of its trash. In the early 1900s, the city turned to dumping trash into the ocean. Even though it was illegal, as much as 80% of the city's trash ended up in the sea. This continued until 1934, when a Supreme Court case forced the city to stop ocean dumping. In the 70s, incinerators used for much of the 1900s were closed down because they didn't meet the EPA's clean air standards. So the city opened up landfills across the five boroughs, including at one point, the world's largest. In 1973, New York even built out Lower Manhattan using trash mounds. But even that wasn't enough. With nowhere else to put it, the city began sending its waste to other states. Most of the landfills in this area have been closed down so that available landfills are getting further and further away. Exporting trash is a costly practice with a big environmental footprint, and it puts the burden on communities far from these shiny skyscrapers. For now, New York City's only choice is to keep exporting the trash. But ultimately, the department says the best solution would be getting New Yorkers to waste less altogether. Trash is like one of those things that you put it outside and forget about it. I think everybody should know what happens to what they get rid of. If you know where it's going and you don't like where it's going, maybe you'll find ways to recycle things. I would never take anything home because my wife wouldn't allow it. But there'll be a but there. If I see something that's Star Wars, I'm gonna look for it and make, if it's good, I'm gonna take it home. Unlike New York City's trash, Airlines can't afford to throw away parts that are broken. If a plane gets sick, it might end up here, at Delta Technical Operations in Atlanta. At nearly 3 million square feet, it's the biggest aircraft repair shop in North America. Here, mechanics, technicians, and engineers fix nearly 1,000 planes a year, with all kinds of issues, from a loose screw to an engine failure. 
but it takes a lot more than elbow grease to get a plane back in the air. This is a bustling and expensive 24-hour operation. The work never stops because the, the planes never stop. That's Cedric. Back in February, before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, he took us behind the scenes of Delta's massive airplane hospital. Let me put my bomb cap on. I look like somebody. Delta Tech Ops is a maintenance repair and overhaul, or MRO business. We do everything that you see on that aircraft. We have component maintenance, engine maintenance, and aircraft maintenance. 6,000 technicians can fix every inch of pretty much any commercial jet on the planet, from 150 other airlines, government organizations, and even military branches. Our job is basically just to maintain the aircraft, keep them safe. An aircraft ends up here if it's scheduled for maintenance or if something is wrong. And one of the biggest issues the team deals with is engine repairs. When that happens, there's $32 million on the line. First, a plane is grounded and then tugged into this giant hangar. We can have six wide bodies and six narrow bodies in simultaneously. So that's a lot of work that can be done in here at the same time. Technicians run a diagnosis for an engine problem. If they determine it needs fixing, it heads to the engine shop. This division of Tech Ops started in 1961, at the beginning of the jet age. Today, engine repair is the most expensive section of Tech Ops, with $100 million in new facilities, just in the last two years. So the engines come into our shop and we take the engines apart completely. We inspect the parts and anything that we find wrong with them, we are able to repair those things before putting them back into the engine. These are very high value parts, so repairing them is the most economical way to keep our engines flying. Before parts can be fixed up, they get a chemical bath. So most of the engine parts are cleaned in this area. If there's any contaminants on the blades or any of the parts of the aircraft, you wanna make sure that's removed so you can get maximum performance of the engine because of the airflow. Yeah, I used to work back here many years oh, ago. Yeah? I started back here. Next, the engine heads to one of seven bays in the engine shop. What's going on? How you doing? Why has everybody got a smile on their face? That's what I want to know. Y'all act like y'all happy. How you doing? Here, FAA licensed technicians work on and reassemble the engine. We have approximately 900 engines a year come through for various levels of maintenance. Those cover 14 different kinds of engines. I want to show everybody a BR715 engine. So this engine in particular is undergoing light maintenance where it doesn't get fully disassembled. Light maintenance takes anywhere from 15 to 35 days. Heavy maintenance, on the other hand. That's where we'd fully disassemble the engine, go into the internal areas of the engine, and basically refurbish the entire components associated with the engine. That can take over two months. 2,000 piece parts that have to be individually inspected and maintained. This engine is flying approximately five times a day. An engine remains on wing from anywhere from a few years to some of our engine types, as many as seven, eight, or nine years. So we want to take the opportunity while they're here to do everything that we can to ensure that they're reliable for the fleet. If an engine can stay in the air longer, it saves Delta and its customers money. Remember, these things are expensive, and so are all the parts that go into them. This part costs $12,000. And there's 80 of them. Add in the price of the surrounding parts and... But we're looking at about $2.2 million sitting on the table. This is the highest technology portion of the engine. These blades operate at very high temperatures and very high stresses. These fan blades? Out of the latest generation Rolls-Royce Trent engines. Are made of precious metals and alloys and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each. So a modern jet engine is worth several million dollars. The maintenance of those is very, very important to maintaining the value of that asset. Only about 20% of all the engines fixed here are Deltas. The rest are for customers. That's probably UPS right there. We have Azure, Gold, Brazil, and Virgin Australia engines. Repairing all these flying beasts takes a lot of skill and caution. Anything can kill you that, that we touch. Everything is stronger than us. Everything is, is heavier than us. You have to have your head in the game. You're looking at a 13,000 pound engine. Lifting something that heavy, it requires a lot of safety, coordination, teamwork, and attention to detail. But an engine that runs smoothly is just as important. There's no pulling over on the side of the road if there's a problem. They're 40,000 feet in the air, so nothing can go wrong. But it's an example of the precision and the very close tolerances that everything has to be built to because of how fast it all spins and how hot it all gets. We want you to get to your destination safely. 
And that's what this is all about. To keep track of the thousands of repairs and checks, technicians record every step of the disassembly, assembly, and inspection process on work cards. They also rely on fancy gear, from the laser welding equipment to the turbine grinder. That precision is necessary to ensure the efficiency of the engine when we return it to service. All this new equipment also means Delta can repair some of the most technologically advanced commercial engines in the world. That happens out in the newer facility, opened in 2018. Once technicians have restored all the parts, they converge back into one of the engine bays. Here they flip the engine vertically and start reassembling it. The core engine is complete at this point, and they're putting on all of those accessories and harnesses and piping on the outside of the engine. But before an engine can go back on a wing, there's one more step, quality testing. That happens at the world's largest engine test cell. A short drive, or a bike ride, from the engine shops. You don't want to encounter problems while you're installing an engine on wings, so it comes to us and we make sure everything's passed off and clear. This part of the building is where the engines come in. We install and rig the engine, so basically we put the test equipment on the engine and get it ready for it to run. And then this part of the engine is your actual test chambers. The test chamber is the newest addition to Tech Ops, and where the engines are test run, it can handle 150,000 pounds of thrust, even though no engine actually has that kind of power. Engineers run tests 24-7, monitoring engine performance from the control room. The reason we need 24-7 is because of the production coming out of the shops. So I can have three engines prepped and ready, but I got one test chamber. So, you know, we want to keep that test chamber running and keep it moving. So you want to get it in there, get it run, get it back out so we can move our next engine in. Once Ken's team signs off on the new engine, it's carted back to the hangar, secured on the wing, and tugged out for takeoff. As you see, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes at the maintenance program. We're always constantly trying to work to make sure we're safe, effective, and proficient in what we do. That means once we get an aircraft in here, we're trying to make sure that we take care of everything that we need to take care of while it's down, so it can get out and fly. And when it comes back, we'll do it all over again. Planes just like these are used to import billions of flowers from Colombia to Miami, just in time for Valentine's Day. Every year, more than a billion flowers come into the U.S. for Valentine's Day. Most come from massive farms in Colombia. But these roses have as little as 48 hours to get cut and flown to Miami before they wilt. They have a short lifetime and thus require the most rapid form of transportation, and that is by air. It takes a vast network of farmers, air cargo, coolers, and customs officers working 24-7. Leading up to Valentine's Day, the amount of flowers coming to the airport double and triple. Treating these flowers right is even a matter of protecting the U.S. The danger of an exotic pest to establish in the United States, our food supply is affected. From Greenhouse to Gift, we follow the journey of your Valentine's Day bouquet. 70% of cut flowers imported to the U.S. come from Colombia. From farms like this one, with over 2,800 acres, Elite Flower is the largest privately owned farm in the country. The temperate climate, high altitude, and 12 hours of sunlight create the perfect growing conditions for these blooms. Producimos alrededor de 800 millones de tallos al año, de los cuales 400 millones, la mitad, son rosas. That would fill up 414 Boeing 767s. And even within roses, there are a hundred varieties. Out in the greenhouse, socially distanced workers inspect each flower from petal to stem for rot or bugs. Proceso lo que hacemos es seleccionar la flor por sus colores, eh, por el tamaño de cabeza, Eh, se hace una selección para que haya una consistencia en el armado, se arma el ramo. Using shears, workers cut each flower off one by one. Lo que pasa en el metabolismo de la flor es apenas tú la cortas, la flor empieza un proceso de mortalidad. To slow that decay, the flowers are sent to a cold room for a minimum of 12 hours. This begins what's known as the cold chain. El éxito es eh, mantener la cadena de frío lo más constante posible, alrededor de los 38 grados Fahrenheit. Extra leaves and thorns are stripped off the stem using this tool. Workers wear thick gloves to guard themselves from thorns. Elite flower is buzzing year-round, but it gets especially busy in February, 
In the weeks leading up to Valentine's Day, the company adds an extra 4,000 employees and generates 90% of its profits. Elite partners with UPS to fly these flowers to the U.S. Each plane can hold up to a million flowers, but airlines like Avianca or Latam are also big flower movers. 89% of all flowers entering the United States by air came through Miami International Airport. It's an airport! That's, that's business, that's, that's money. After a four-hour journey, this temperature-controlled Latam Airlines flight landed in Miami. This airplane arrived with more than 50 tons of flour from Colombia. And then we start to move the one of the 23 pallets that we have here to this machine to download in the flowers. The flowers end up in this cold warehouse, held at the same temperature as that airplane. The most important thing for us is to maintain the cool change. There are almost 400,000 square feet of cooling facilities at Miami Airport. That were built because of the flower industry. Flowers represent our largest commodity coming in. Next, Customs and Border Protection checks flowers from every flight. Over 84,000 units for inspection here. Agricultural specialists like Stanley pull just 2% of the flowers from each flight to inspect. We have a sampling protocol. We know for sure that that 2% is representing the 100% of the flowers that are coming in. Inspections are done quickly, so the flowers don't wilt or get handled too much. We make sure that our inspection area is in our cooler. The temperature is good for the flowers and for our personnel. One by one, officers open up boxes and remove the bundles, wearing PPE to protect against diseases and pesticides. They take a bouquet of flowers and they remove the plastic and then they shake it gently. They have to get a white background and if anything falls, they'll have to observe if there is any insects, but at the same time, they are doing the visual observation to see whether the leaves have any kind of signs of diseases. Like a bacterial or fungal disease. If there's a fungal inspection, you see some rusty patches. She has seen a sign of maybe a disease. Now she has to use a loop to magnify. Even more important to look out for, bugs. Leaf miners, caterpillars, fruit flies, and beetles. Critters that may seem harmless, but if they got through, they could wreak havoc on the U.S. agricultural system. Every year, United States spend billions of dollars in eradication programs in order to eradicate those pests. From 2007 to 2014, Florida's orange and grapefruit growers lost $2.9 billion trying to eradicate the Asian citrus psyllid. So if an officer finds something... We kind of collect it in a vial with alcohol for preservation. That specimen goes to USDA, Department of Agriculture, for identification. And for the flowers? The importer has basically three choices. One is to return to origin, Two is to fumigate, or third is to destroy. Destruction is the last resort. Treatment is most often fumigation. In an average day, we find around 50 to 60 different pests. Some flowers, like the eucalyptus, are high risk for carrying hitchhikers, while roses are less risky. After the fumigation takes place, then the rest of the shipment can go to the public. CBP inspects flowers every day, but on Valentine's... Last season, we inspected over 700 million stems of flowers. If CBP officers don't find anything, they bring the flowers back to that cold chain warehouse. And when the customer arrives here, we take the flowers and go to the delivery area to load the flower directly to the truck. The majority of these flowers are trucked to the northeast or west coast of the U.S where folks like you and me can treat our loved ones to a colorful bouquet for Valentine's Day. Flowers, narcotics, and food aren't the only thing CBP looks for. We travel back to JFK to shadow customs officers as they seize counterfeit goods. This guitar might look like a real Gibson, but it's not. This is coming from China. And wait, it's and it's Gibson, S-O-N, not S-U-N. These are fake too. Coach bag with a Michael Kors zipper. Ooh, we have Nike sneakers here. They're a part of a huge counterfeit industry worth over a trillion dollars. And since these fakes come through the mail, Customs and Border Protection officers are tasked with seizing them. In 2020 alone, CBP seized over 26,000 counterfeit goods shipments. The knockoffs are getting better and better and more profitable for these counterfeiters. 
Not only are these fake products dangerous for consumers. They've had cadmium, arsenic, lead, and cyanide inside makeup, and it's disfigured people. Perfume has had horse urine in it. Profits of counterfeits are known to fund criminal activity, including attacks and bombings. People think it's a victimless crime. Oh, what's the harm? I'm just buying this pocketbook. What could it do? It does a lot because the problem is where the money is going. And as everything is now sold online, buying counterfeit goods is getting easier. But stopping them is much harder. It's like whack-a-mole. They come up, you go after them, they come down, they go up again. And here we have a counterfeit watch. That's Customs Officer Steve Nethersall. He's America's first line of defense against counterfeits. I've had many million-dollar watch seizures. We visited him at JFK to learn how he's spotting and stopping fakes, all while the counterfeit market is surging. Counterfeit goods are anything that infringes on a company's intellectual property rights, or IPR. Think fake Air Jordans, Rolexes, or Louis Vuitton purses. And because these products are trademarked, counterfeiting them is illegal. You can just be guaranteed that your product is going to get counterfeited. It's just a matter of time. Half of the counterfeit goods CBP seized in 2019 came through the mail from China, followed by Hong Kong and Singapore. Before a package ever lands in the U.S., CBP gathers intelligence on the sender, container, and aircraft. Using this intel and x-ray machines, CBP narrows down a million packages into the ones that'll get pulled for further inspection. Those suspicious packages will go straight to Steve. He'll start by looking at the box. Well, I'm looking because I don't have my glasses on, so I'm cheating. The first, when it comes in, is the country of origin. Louis Vuitton, they're coming from France. The watch is coming from Switzerland. When it's coming from China, bing, that's your number one red flag. Then you look at the dilapidated boxes. Then he'll open up the package. And this is from a familiar sender that sends counterfeit items, possibly footwear. Ooh. We have Nike sneakers here. This is obviously to save space, but this is not traditional of the manufacturer to crush all these items. We try and take care when we open it up so that if it is something that's legitimate, we'll tape it up and put it back the way it originally was. But that's rare. More than likely, what he finds is fake. The most common counterfeited handbag is Louis Vuitton. The most counterfeited sneaker is Nike Air Jordans. Here we have a Rolex watch. But how does he know they're counterfeits? Well, brands train Steve on the telltale signs to spot a fake. They'll sometimes send a kit, and the kit will include a genuine product. It will include a kind of a hit list as to what to look for. Most of the hit list is kept top secret to protect the brand against counterfeiters. But Steve could share a few things. Rolex would never put their watches in little Ziploc bags. They don't put these inside it, the silica gel. Rolex does not send to individuals in the United States. They only send to their retail stores. I have another package here. This one's coming from Thailand. We have an assortment of items here. We have Chanel eyewear. We have Gucci eyewear, watches, jewelry, Louis Vuitton pouch. High-end manufacturers like this never co-mingle their products. In other words, a Gucci inside a Fendi or a Louis Vuitton. These people will stuff watches, a wallet inside a handbag. They don't put any of this in it, the filler inside it. And their items wouldn't come in bubble wrap like this. Some of the counterfeits are obvious. Here we have a Burberry coat, and it says Burbelly mistakenly on the button. But some aren't as easy to spot. The quality is getting better. Sometimes these factories, especially in China, it's the same factory that's making the good for the brand owner is also making the counterfeits. And that's a real problem for the luxury brand owners. Sometimes the brands themselves can't even tell the difference. Some of the counterfeits are that good. I've never seen one like this before, so of course I'm going to be delicate with it. The packaging and the brand doesn't look like the normal counterfeit that we normally see. It's coming from Israel. What is the country of manufacture for Paul Reed Smith? So South Korea. Israel is not a manufacturer. There are a lot of red flags. It's like half and half. It's got model code serial number, UPC number. But for co the country that it's coming from is the thing that's throwing me off. So I'm going to put it over here on hold and it'll be determined later on. But in order for Steve to seize anything, there has to be a trademark on that product. Let's see what we got in here. Shirts. Yes, it's all Suzuki shirts. 
Suzuki has motorcycle and car trademark, but not on apparel. So this will end up being released. But whether it's a copycat of a product that's trademarked or not, counterfeits can be dangerous. That fake makeup, well, it can cause rashes, swellings, and burns. They've had cadmium, arsenic, lead, and cyanide inside makeup, and it's disfigured people. Cadmium is in rechargeable batteries and control rods in nuclear reactors. Perfume, they've laboratory tested shown there's been horse urine in it. Steve says fake safety equipment is even more alarming. When it comes to automotive parts, that's a very big danger. Spark plugs, which can cause the engine to go on fire. Oil filters that cause instant damage to the engine. Airbags are a big thing. That's something that you may not necessarily realize is something to even consider until you need that airbag and it doesn't go off in the protective way that it should. Counterfeit manufacturers have no regard to health or safety or who they hurt along the way. All they're concerned about is the bottom line. Many studies have shown that counterfeiting is one way criminal organizations fund themselves. The accused group in the 2004 Madrid train bombing sold fake CDs to partially finance their attacks. For the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, co-conspirators in that sold counterfeit t-shirts on Broadway to fund that. The two brothers behind the 2015 attack on the Charlie Hebdo publication that killed 12 people and injured 11, they funded their weapons partly through counterfeit Nike sneakers. And sometimes it's hard to make that connection between a purse you might have bought on the street corner and organized crime activity. But this activity that seems to be going under the radar can be lucrative for criminals. And it's because it's high profit and low risk. So when Steve finds a counterfeit good, he seizes it. Then he figures out the item's MSRP, using the brand's website and CBP's internal database. This one here would be about $11,000. That's the MSRP, what the manufacturer would be losing had this been genuine. These are generally on the internet for about $200. In 2020, CBP seized over 26,000 packages for intellectual property rights violations. That's a total value of over a billion dollars. But it's not just the manufacturer's profits that take a hit, their reputations do. When a buyer doesn't know they've bought a knockoff and it falls apart, it's the real company that customer blames. And over time, consumers' trust in the brand is eroded. Steve does all the paperwork for every seized package. Then he stores the goods. Here we have a post on full of seizures, so it's gonna go into the storage room. In the end, all these products will be destroyed. They're incinerated at a top secret location. So what happens to the counterfeiters? For one, Homeland Security investigations can decide to open up a case. But Steve says that doesn't happen often. The first problem? The HSI agents, there's only so many of them. They're going to deal with the most important thing, which is narcotics. All the fentanyl and the cocaine that coming out are killing people. That is a top priority, and it should be. And the second problem? The nature of counterfeiting is that these bad actors operate without uh, respect for borders. It's oftentimes very difficult to actually get an individual because they're not located in the U.S. American authorities don't have jurisdiction in China, where a lot of counterfeits are made. So arresting counterfeiters within the U.S. is hard. In 2020, Homeland Security investigations arrested 203 people for counterfeiting. Of those, just 93 were convicted. Diane says a more successful tactic is going after counterfeiters online, Many sell their copycat products on platforms like Amazon, Alibaba, and eBay. To fight the fakes, online retailers have launched anti-counterfeiting measures. A lot of these marketplaces are really working with brand owners. We do not want to be a place where a customer purchases an item that ultimately could impact their health and safety. Amazon's program is called Project Zero. When companies register for Amazon, they give information on their brands, trademarks, and listings. Using this data, Amazon's algorithm scans 5 billion products a day for signs of counterfeiting. It looks for things like blurry product photos, copycat product descriptions. Payment information. We look at price point. We look at reviews. And if a listing turns out to be a counterfeit, Amazon will suspend the account. In 2019, Amazon blocked 6 billion suspected bad listings on its site. We might suspend funds. We might quarantine inventory. Then Amazon's new counterfeit crimes unit takes over. Formed in 2020, the unit's made up of former FBI, Homeland Security agents, and federal prosecutors, like Kibaru. Whenever a counterfeit is identified, Kibaru's team will send a packet of information to law enforcement. 
This information can consist of IP addresses, banking information, email addresses that help us identify the person behind the computer. And to skirt the jurisdiction problem, the unit sends data to agencies all over the world. To Europol, Canadian law enforcement, we partner and work with law enforcement on the ground in China. Local law enforcement does react when a brand owner comes to them and wants to do a raid. And I've been involved in quite a few of them where they're really successful. And we can then decide whether we want to pursue a civil suit or if we want to pursue a criminal enforcement action against them. But even if counterfeiters are caught, sentences tend to be low. For counterfeiting, offenders could face 10 years in prison. Compare that to, say, drug trafficking, where punishment can range from 20 years to life in prison, all the way up to a death sentence. And counterfeiters are getting creative and making their products seem legitimate. From creating fake Amazon listings to flooding the U.S. trademark office with phony applications. It is frustrating that it doesn't stop, that every day there's new infringements that we uncover for clients. And it's all led to a surging industry for counterfeits. Today, it makes up 3.3% of global trade. When counterfeits are being sold, oftentimes taxes aren't being paid for those goods, and they in turn can impact economies as well. By 2022, the counterfeits industry is expected to suck $4.2 trillion from the global economy, and it could endanger over 5 million legitimate jobs. Because we're dealing with a moving target, it's a challenging crime problem to address. It grows every day, and it's because of consumer demand. People need to be educated more about the dangers. And the old saying, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Coming up next, we take a look into the business of keeping airline passengers comfortable. What makes our job very challenging is it's a game of inches. It's fighting for every little bit of space. Airplane interiors are a battleground among airlines. Who can make 15 hours straight in the air most comfortable, even if you're stuck in economy? But comfort isn't the easiest to come by flying in a metal tube 40,000 feet in the sky. There are challenges because you're in a very small space with a lot of people. We went on board Delta's redesigned Boeing 777 with the people whose job it is to make flying suck a little less. Delta announced the redesign of its entire 777 fleet back in 2018, and the airline finished updating the 18 planes in Singapore in early 2020. All four cabins underwent upgrades. When that 777 comes in, it has a very old interior, so they rip it all out and they install everything new. There are thousands of hours of engineering that has to be done to install all that equipment and develop the interface diagrams, develop the certification documentation. While Delta has announced it will retire the Boeing 777 fleet, its facelift can still give us a look into how designers maximize limited space on a plane. This is Ashley. Ashley identifies what frustrates customers on board and comes up with possible solutions. So in product development, we have thought about every single inch of this aircraft, from the business class cabin to the size of the closets to the size of the lavatories. Then engineers like Alice figure out how to bring those ideas to life from this fancy lab in Atlanta. What we're trying to do is figure out, can we take that technology and is it ready to be on an airplane with 281 passengers at 30,000 feet flying 400 miles an hour? And then if it is, what we do is we want to execute it as flawlessly as we possibly can. So what changes did designers make? We'll start with business class. This whole seat has memory foam cushioning in it. It's designed to be like a mattress, basically. For us, it's all about picking very careful, sustainable, non-flammable materials, but also making sure they're comfortable as well. We also have all of our controls for the seat here. What we really work on is also building spatial mock-ups to really determine that every passenger of all sizes is comfortable in the space here. And if not, then we'll work to adjust. Can we adjust the console size to make it smaller or bigger and give more room here? Every suite also has a fully enclosed door. And if you're in the center seats, then you also have a privacy divider between the two seats. Every seat has a leg rest, foot rest, got a remote control, got my nice 13.3 inch high definition IFE screen. That in-flight entertainment system is wireless, the first of its kind in the industry. It was developed in that fancy lab. This is our IFE lab. What we've done with wireless seatback IFE, we eliminate the ethernet cable. And by eliminating all those cables that are running all over the airplane, we save about a pound per seat. That's about 281 pounds per aircraft. It basically equates to 1,330 metric tons of carbon emission savings per year. Alice partnered with the Georgia Tech Research Institute to create a software system in the IFE that could easily be updated with new technology. 
we can't set a whole airplane fleet down every two years and, and redo it all. So we have to think very innovatively. It also has to last a long time. These displays on an A220, that thing flies eight to 12 hours a day, maybe more. It could possibly be on almost that whole time. We worry a lot about reliability as well. Back in Premium Select, beyond the TV, there's also plugs and USB ports and a couple other tricks to designing within the small space. So every seat also has a very large tray table. These seats are so far apart that to put a tray table here, I mean, you would really be reaching. So we put the tray table in the arm. The back of the seat's also grooved out to still give you those extra inches there in your knee space. This is Delta's Comfort Plus cabin. We do want to create that open, airy cabin. Part of that also is just the way that the bins are designed, right? So they're still high enough up that you have lots of space and headroom, but they're big enough to be functional to hold all of our passengers' bags they're bringing on board. All of our passengers usually really care about storage. Probably fits maybe six roller boards, but if I put six roller boards in here, I'm not gonna be able to close it. Delta came to us and said, hey, we, we have this problem. We spend a lot of money on back injuries to flight attendants. Can you guys think of some way to fix it? And so we were given the challenge to say, is there an easier, better way to be able to push up these bins? We partnered with a supplier in Germany to come up with this electromechanical device. The bin lift assist will actually click on when this weight reaches 45 pounds, and it will make the close force like I'm closing a bin with only 35 pounds inside. Engineers also had to make the bins durable. These bins are probably used, you know, 500 times a year by all our passengers. So that means just they take a beating. We have to really be careful about the materials that we put on board to make sure that they're reliable and robust and not breaking. This is really where we spend the most time. I think the hardest part of an economy seat is the inches. So the industry standard on a 777 aircraft is actually to put 10 seats wide. Instead of squeezing in a 10th seat in each row, we maintain nine. Everyone hates getting that middle seat on a long haul flight. So instead of having two middle seats here in the center, we only have one. It's also about giving passengers things to do at their seats while they're on such a long flight. In the event that the passenger in front of me wants to sleep and they recline their seat, then my screen here tilts so that I can get a better viewing angle regardless of what the passenger in front of me is doing. But the design details extend beyond just the seats and into the whole plane. They added more space in front of the lavatories for people to line up. Making sure the aisles are wide enough so that customers can easily get their bags up and down. The flight attendants can also easily push the carts up and down. They also tweaked the lighting system. Our full spectrum LED lighting has seven different lighting scenarios. So for your meal setting, you're gonna have a nice warm orange red color that is supposed to stimulate hunger. We also have a sunset setting, which is a couple minutes of transition, which actually replicates the sunset on board. And then it takes you to night mode. As a designer, I've sat in these seats. I've flown all over the world. I want to know what the experience is like, and I want to know the customer pain points, mainly because I've experienced them. But it's also my job to try to ease those pain points. But making any changes to a fleet, big or small, takes years. We haven't even talked about certification yet. Every single seat that you sit in has been thoroughly tested to withstand an accident if that were to ever happen. Every single piece on here is built with all those certifications and testing before it ever goes on board. Ashley said the 777 redesign took three and a half years. And I would say at least 20 different teams at Delta all working together. We came and we tested it. We had some flight attendants come in and try it out. We did the certification, the installation, and all the engineering so we could put it on the airplane, make sure it was safe, and flew it away. Last but not least, we're headed to Chicago to see how 10 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines are distributed globally a day. Cargo planes like this MD-11 will soon be transporting the most anticipated vaccine of the 21st century. Prior to the coronavirus, Lufthansa Cargo invested $5 million to upgrade its facility at Chicago O'Hare International Airport to handle a lot more pharmaceutical cargo, 200 tons a day to be exact. So when pharma companies began to develop the coronavirus vaccine, Lufthansa was in a fortuitous position. Vaccine manufacturers reached out to the company, which has just 19 planes in its cargo fleet, to help distribute millions of vaccines in record time. It's a product everyone on Earth needs as quickly as possible, but distributing the various vaccines to the entire world is going to be a massive undertaking. It will require solving huge logistical challenges, 
The different vaccines need to be kept at various cold temperatures, transported to isolated and hard to reach areas, and fit on different sized planes. Nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen with the vaccine. There was an estimation that we probably need approximately 8,000 freighter flights to globally distribute this vaccine. We don't have that many aircraft. Prior to the pandemic, 50% of all cargo shipments were transported on passenger aircraft in the same luggage hold as our suitcases. But that all changed in March. Boom, now you have no passenger aircraft. So now everything is going on the freighters. That's David. He and his team took us behind the scenes at Lufthansa's cargo facility to see how it's preparing to move vaccines through this nearly 110,000 square foot terminal that runs around the clock. It's all done by a crew of over 200 highly qualified personnel who can load two freighter planes full of 112 tons of cargo every day. Through the facility, we could probably transport anywhere from two to 10 million vaccines every day. We do expect that once the vaccine is ready, that a lot of it will come through this facility. Not many cargo facilities have the massive cooling infrastructure required to handle large shipments of COVID vaccines. If you have a vaccine or something which got uh, you know, too high of a temperature or too cold of a temperature, it might not be good for the patient anymore. Benno works for D.B. Schenker, a logistics company that specializes in transporting pharmaceuticals with strict temperature controls and is partnering with Lufthansa to ship the vaccines. In the pharma industry, as you can see all over the place, it says two to eight degrees. That's the typical way you ship pharma. So the, the biggest challenge is to keep that product at this uh, defined temperature from the moment we pick it up to the moment we deliver it. But Lufthansa Cargo is equipped to take on the challenge. Before COVID happened, we made a huge investment here and it's really, it's old school stuff. Giant freezers and fridges that are connected and monitored. We have all these airlines asking us, can we use your warehouse? Because we happen to have the infrastructure ready for COVID. Lufthansa's $5 million investment resulted in two new rooms. The first one, called PPH, is for items to be stored at 15 to 25 degrees Celsius. We are here in a PPH room, Pharma room, which stands for perishable passive high temperature 15 to 25. This is the place where we store such shipments coming in from all over the world until delivered. The PPH room can store all sorts of things like flowers, stem cells, and live fish. Its 15 to 25 temperature range is designed so nothing gets too hot or too cold. But that's not the only specialized room Lufthansa has. Welcome to our freezer room, which is setting 80, minus 18 Celsius degrees. It's suitable for the frozen goods. Usually we have a smaller packages like this one. Small to medium boxes like those can be packed with your regular old ice packs or dry ice to keep the products inside fresh or cool. But with dry ice, there are restrictions on how much of it you can load onto a plane. You're very limited on, on a passenger plane because the dry ice will uh, take the oxygen out of the air. So if, if we have too much dry ice here and we are standing all around here after a certain time, we will not be able to breathe. Vaccines requiring extremely cold storage could be transported with nitrogen cryogenic liquid or liquid nitrogen, which could be especially vital for Pfizer's vaccine since it will need to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius or minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Nobody can setting minus 94. So those are canisters, the raw vaccine is put inside. The vaccines you've heard about all have different temperature needs. While Pfizer's needs to be stored at those subarctic temperatures, Moderna's vaccine needs to be frozen at negative 20 degrees Celsius if it spends more than 30 days in refrigerated storage. AstraZeneca's can be stored at the same temperature as a home fridge for up to six months. The big challenge will be the minus uh, 70, minus 80, Celsius. Airlines and freight forwarders have to invest in mobile coolers because you will not build a cooler like this for minus 70 degrees because if you think about it, you need PPE material to go into it. I couldn't go like this into a minus 70 degrees. The good thing is Pfizer has already created its own container that uses dry ice to keep its vaccine cool for at least 10 days. Other vaccines that don't require such low temperatures like Moderna's can use already existing solutions like these Envirotainers. The battery charge on here is 100%. The set temperature on this is minus 20. These Envirotainers, specially designed for transporting pharmaceuticals, can keep everything inside at temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius. 
They even have their own power supply, enabling them to operate without being plugged in for 10 to 15 hours, which allows them to withstand long flights. There's cords here that plug right into the outlets that are in the containers there. When we have these containers here, they still need to be maintained as far as their temperature is concerned because they run on a charge. They won't stay long in the, in the facility, but they have a home to sit into until it's time for them to go. But in the event of flight cancellations, delays, or shipments to remote locations, battery-operated containers can pose a risk. You cannot have nothing except the airplane engine running inside. They don't want your phone on. So can you imagine how it would be if you have 10, 15 containers plugged in? That's impossible. The Lufthansa facility does have one more way of keeping things cold. This is where all the UODs or the pallets that come off the aircraft, they get stored in here. This is my favorite part of the warehouse. I call it Bumblebee. As you can see, it is a little bit like a vending machine, basically a giant storage system. Using this 30-year-old giant vending machine-like device, Lufthansa is able to store pallets in three levels of stacked rooms with garage door-like openings. 18 of the rooms are temperature controlled, and each can store two full pallets of pharmaceuticals. And the only, the only thing that's been in this warehouse longer than this machine is this machine right here. Still running, running strong, no problem. When it's time to retrieve a shipment, an operator will have Bumblebee go right to the appropriate door, retrieve the pallet, and load it onto a transporter that will take it directly to the plane. Some of the pharma cargo may find its way onto pallets like this. Specially trained operations managers put these together based on weight and volume distribution, all while trying to maximize the space available on the plane. The more we maximize, the more extra we can take on the flight there. It's really just, it's a game. So good builders are Tetris players. They have very good spatial vision. If a pallet like this is going on the MD-11, the plane we saw on our visit, it can't just be cube-shaped. The contour is built to the shape of the aircraft. So this is a, uh, a main deck position. You want to maximize space, so that's why you see that curvature here. Cargo that's loaded in there cannot go outside those boundaries because otherwise it'll damage the aircraft. And there's a distance of two inches that it's got to be away from that wall in order to keep it in a safety controlled distance. Yep, every pallet has to be built around where it will be on the plane and what shape the interior takes at that position. While the front offers more height, the tail does not. All right, let's take you up to the MD-11. We're going up to the cockpit right now. Please watch your steps, walk carefully as the space is tight between the pallets. So as you can see up here on the aircraft, it's pretty much a, a skeleton. You know, all, it's very thin walls that you have out here. It's just like a cardboard. Um, and that's all that's protecting the aircraft. So you don't want weight, because as soon as you put more weight on an aircraft, you lose cargo. Pharma is gonna be transported on our UODs. These locks are what holds the pallet from moving back and forward, and also upward positions. The only difference between cargo and pharma is you have your temperature restrictions. You just notify the crew and tell them to put the whole main deck at that temperature, or the lowered holds, which will be the forward hold in front of the aircraft downstairs. You can set that uh, temperature as well. Ops agents like Ricky have to get everything right within the confines of the plane, weight limitations, and weather conditions. These uh, white uh, plastic, as you can see, it's different from this other one. This is just clear plastic. Uh, this is regular cargo. And these are our, our temperature controlled UODs. And we put this white plastic here as a protective covering so it can reflect the sun or anything. It'll keep you it to the temperature that it's needed while it's outside. When it's heavy rain, snow, sleet, all that stuff accumulates on the cargo. When you move that into the aircraft, that drips into the avionics compartment. It can happen on an aircraft that the avionics compartment just goes blank. The entire aircraft is dark. That is a huge risk. So when that happens, our ops team, they have to basically make sure there's no water anywhere. That aircraft sits there until the next day, until everything's dry, until everything's inspected, and it can fly. And all this has to happen within a very limited time frame. We have a ground time of uh, two hours and a half to offload the aircraft and load it. That's as much time that they give us. That's for a full turnaround. If cargo is not loaded perfectly, then shipments could be delayed, someone could get hurt, or pharmaceuticals on the aircraft could be deemed unusable. If the aircraft is delayed until 7 in the morning, you got to say until 7 in the morning. 
we as operations were the final check that we have to prevent anything from happening. While Lufthansa has nine 777s that can carry 103,000 kilograms, its other cargo aircraft, the MD-11 seen here, can carry only 90% of that, or about 93,000 kilograms. And it was never meant to carry cargo in the first place. The MD-11 was originally built as a passenger aircraft. We converted ours to freighters. We have three MD-11s left in our fleet. We were supposed to no longer have them. They're old aircraft. They're very nice, very beautiful, but very old aircraft. They're also very difficult to manage from an operational uh, point of view. They should have been phased out already at the end of, by the end of the year, but they're keeping them a little longer because of the demand that we have. The, the main difference from this, the 777 and this, this aircraft has three engines and it's got one in the back and that's uh, one of our critical points. This aircraft is so tail heavy uh, that we have to have, to have extra precaution on not tipping it because if you have too much weight in the back, this aircraft will go up and those wheels will come down. The MD-11 is like playing Tetris. If the four of us standing here on an empty aircraft walk to the back of the aircraft, that air airplane tilts and you can no longer fly that aircraft. That's, that's an AOG, an aircraft on ground. While the crew has to worry about the MD-11 popping a wheelie, the process is much easier with Lufthansa's 777s. The 777 only has two engines and they're located in the middle, so it's very hard for it to tip. So safety, uh, safety related, the 777 is a lot better, fuel efficient than the MD-11. A 777 aircraft, which is the largest aircraft we have that, can, that is a freighter aircraft, commercial freighter aircraft, holds approximately 100 tons. So in this facility, we could run two full freighter aircraft every day, coming in with pharmaceuticals and delivering them. And while the Lufthansa facility is ready to handle 224 tons on two 777s a day, that still might not be enough planes. There was an estimation that we probably need approximately 8,000 freighter flights. That's 8,000 freighters carrying only the vaccine. But remember, these flights also normally get loaded with shipments like furniture, pets, cars, and all sorts of other cargo. And this is all happening as we enter a holiday season in a year that has already put massive strain on the air cargo industry. It is going to be a huge congestion. My understanding is there is going to be a huge competition for space. So if Amazon pays more than the United States government for the space on the aircraft, then we're, you know, they're selling it to Amazon. But passengers are flying less because of COVID-19. So why not just load up all of those passenger planes with vaccines? You can't really convert an aircraft like that. I can't go, boom, you know, now it's a freighter aircraft. The biggest problem with that is the door. So you can't, you look around here, you can't fit that through a passenger door. The increase in cargo shipments has presented its own challenges for Lufthansa. Suddenly, everybody needs qualified people who can work on freighters. Everybody here at the airport is trying to poach our people. Our biggest challenge in, in the middle of this pandemic is suddenly all the other competitors want our people and we have limited resources to train new staff. So you really, your, your Steve's that has been here for 42 years and your Husmira's and all these people that are qualified and know what they're doing, they're all being approached by everybody else because everybody needs them for, for, for COVID and for freight. At the same time, Lufthansa Cargo had to implement social distancing, mandatory masks and temperature checks in its facility. We're an essential business, obviously. I always say, you know, try moving freight on a Zoom call. It doesn't really work, right? So we have to make sure that our people stay healthy. Distance, travel times, and the urgency of the vaccine will add even more complexity to this already complicated process. You need a lot of space, but only for a few days, and, and then you don't need it anymore. Especially when you go to Africa, when you go to remote areas, uh, it might take more than, than 10 hours to be there. And while that's a large-scale problem to solve, there are some micro-issues that need to be addressed closer to home. We're getting electrical forklifts to handle the pharmaceuticals. If you're in the room with the pharmaceuticals, you don't want to be using a, a propane forklift for too long because it can be a contaminant. These are all the adjustments that we have to make in order to make everything work. And a lot of things we're learning as we're going. We will definitely do everything possible to accommodate because this is huge. If you do pharma uh, or vaccine, you know that there is a patient behind. So that automatically gives you a, a sense of, uh, you know, even more responsibility to make sure that, not to say that the other freight is not important, but, uh, you know, this is, this is something which we obviously have to be uh, monitoring any minute because it, if it goes bad, it can, it can cost uh, the life of, of a human being. 
It gives you a big sense of responsibility. We're putting Band-Aid on the wall.